the 2021 European Hematology Association EHA virtual conference was a forum that was a good opportunity for many different companies to present their latest results. In this video, we're diving into the press releases and shared data or presentations from Lubert Bio and CRISPR Therapeutics related to their treatments of beta thalassemia, and we'll see if we can make any inferences by comparing the two. If you follow this field closely as an investor, you'll know there is a race going on to determine who might be the first one to bring a treatment to market, as well as who might have the best treatment to offer. There's a lot at stake because for these treatments, as they are rare diseases, the orphan drug status applies, and the first one to market is surely to be guaranteed market exclusivity for many years to come. So let's dive straight in, dissect the data, see what we can learn, and maybe find out if there are any indications as to who of the two companies might have the better treatment. Although I have a PhD in biomedical engineering, and over 15 years of working experience in the healthcare industry, I do not intend to give you investment advice. Please consider your own risk profile before making any investments and research your investments wisely. As mentioned in the introduction, the EHA virtual conference was the perfect forum for CRISPR therapeutics to provide updates on their CTX001 treatment for the treatment of beta thalassemia as well as sickle cell disease. CRISPR therapeutics provided this press release on June 11, but also in addition list on their website two very interesting presentations with the detailed results of their clinical trial activities to date for patients treated for beta thalassemia as well as sickle cell disease. Likewise, Bluebird Bio also provided a press release detailing the updates from their one-time gene therapy for the treatment of beta thalassemia, abbreviated Betty Cell. So let's stick to beta thalassemia and see what data CRISPR Therapeutics had to share in their poster presentation. Financials aside, as a smart investor in this field, you ultimately know that it is the science that will dictate the future potential gains. Here's the poster presented by CRISPR Therapeutics at the EHA virtual conference. And as always, for easy access, you know that you'll find the link for this presentation as well as any other reference data in the description below the video. There's a treasure trove of data here, so let's zoom in and take a look at the new data. Although I know that the information covered in the introduction is probably well known by most regular viewers of my channel, I nevertheless hope that I will also reach new potential investors who are interested in gene editing technologies and the investment opportunities therein. So I hope you don't mind that I'll cover some of the details in the introduction for background. Beta thalassemia is a rare but devastating genetic disease that manifests early in childhood. The disease symptoms generally occur shortly after the transition from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin takes place. The production of fetal hemoglobin stops through the expression of the BCL11A gene, which is a repressor, and deactivates the production of fetal hemoglobin. Once only adult hemoglobin circulates predominantly in the bloodstream, the Z symptoms start to manifest because beta thalassemia is a disorder, a genetic disorder, that reduces the production of adult hemoglobin, and therefore the ability of the blood to carry oxygen. The genetic treatment approach employed by CRISPR therapeutics in the CTX001 is to genetically reduce the expression of BCL11A gene and therefore reactivate the production of fetal hemoglobin. The clinical results from the phase 1-2 clinical study with CTX001 shows that there is a meaningful increase in the total hemoglobin production and notably of the fetal type. Fetal hemoglobin production remains stable over time and within two months after treatment, uh, patients in beta thalassemia no longer required transfusions. The results presented at this conference are from 15 patients currently enrolled in the study in an open-label multicenter clinical trial. Those 15 patients span all the different genotypes or genetic variations in the disease category and have a medium age of 23 years and all required 
blood transfusions prior to the treatment with CTX001. Also encouraging is to notice that neutrophil engraftment happened on average after 29 days and the platement engrafted after 40 days following the treatment. This basically means that the genetically modified uh, stem cells have fully integrated and are thriving in the patient's body. The clinical follow-up period after the treatment for these patients is on median 8.7 months, but in actuality ranges between 4 to up to 26 months. The treatment appears to be quite safe. There's only one patient out of the 15 who had four serious adverse events that could potentially be linked to CTX001, although those have also cleared since the treatment. In addition, three patients experienced serious adverse reactions due to the myeloablative treatment with Buzulfan prior to the administration of CTX001. So here is where it gets interesting. We see here the hemoglobin fraction prior to the treatment, which of course is predominantly made up of adult hemoglobin. Then once CTX001 is infused, we see that within two months, um, the adult form of hemoglobin starts to go down and is more and more replaced by the fetal form of hemoglobin. And this trend continues over time. Then by the end, we have one patient with the 24 months follow-up data. You can see that almost the majority is made up of the fetal hemoglobin form. Also overall, the total amount of hemoglobin circulating in the bloodstream in terms of grams per deciliter seems to increase over time. And here we can see that indeed, two months after the treatment with CTX001, the patients no longer required blood transfusions. So now that we have looked at the highlights from CRISPR Therapeutics, let's take a look at what data Bluebird Bio had to share. On the conference website, we find a link to the oral presentation given on the Bluebird Bio treatment. Now, unlike CRISPR Therapeutics, Bluebird Bio are already in phase three clinical study and they have broken down the genotypes into two different studies, which are North Star 2 and North Star 3. The primary endpoint in these two studies is the total weighted average of hemoglobin, which should be larger than 9 grams per deciliter and also not requiring any blood transfusions for more than 12 months. The data presented by Bluebird Bio is for 41 patients with a follow-up period of roughly one month to a maximum of a little over 42 months, on average, roughly 24 months follow-up. Also, the duration for neutrophil and platelet engraftment is provided, so let's make a comparison how Bluebird's data stack up against CRISPR therapeutics. Surely, when comparing these data, we have to be conscious of the different number of patients, so the statistics may play out somewhat differently, but overall, we see the following. Neutrophil engraftment was slightly longer in the case of CRISPR therapeutics, but platelet engraftment was shorter in comparison to the treatment by Bluebird Bio. So if we continue to look at the data, we see that transfusion independence was achieved by 30 out of 34 patients, which constitutes a little over 88%. Now, previously they talked about 40 or 41 patients respectively, so I'm assuming that 34 patients were considered here because they were far and out, out after the administration of the treatment. Furthermore, the average weighted hemoglobin was 11.5 grams per deciliter and all 30 patients maintain transfusion independence for a median of 20.6 months with an actual duration between 12 to 39.4 months. I thought also very interesting was the statement I circled here in red, which says that transfusion independence was achieved at six months post-infusion. So then how does the transfusion independence data compare between CRISPR therapeutics and Bluebird's data? Again, neglecting the different sample sizes in the two treatment populations, we nevertheless see that CRISPR therapeutics treatment achieved a 100% success rate with bringing patients to transfusion independence, and this after two months following the treatment. In the case of Bluebird Bios treatment, 88.2% achieved transfusion independence, and this was at the time point six months post-treatment. So we don't necessarily know from this data when transfusion independence started to manifest and appear. 
Apologies for the bad resolution of this graph, but I really had to zoom in on the uh, EHA website in order to really visualize this graph properly. This graph shows the hemoglobin concentrations in grams per deciliter. We see that over the total follow-up period up to 36 months post-treatment, the total hemoglobin concentration or count goes up towards uh, 12 grams per deciliter, which definitely meets the primary endpoint. I also want to emphasize that in the case of the treatment by Bluebird Bio, the gene defect in the adult form of hemoglobin is actually being repaired and the new or the corrected adult hemoglobin is being produced. In comparison, CRISPR therapeutics use a different approach. They activate fetal hemoglobin production, which also addresses the disease, but in a slightly different manner. So how does total hemoglobin compare after the treatment from Bluebird Bio with Betty Cell or CRISPR Therapeutics with CTX001. So, full disclaimer, I was trying to read off from the previously shown table from Bluebird Bio as accurately as possible the data from the chart. Unfortunately, tabulated data was not available. So, I cannot rule out that I have made a few reading errors trying to interpolate the actual numerical values from the Bluebird Bio graph. But basically, I wanted to compare this with that. So here's the comparison. We can clearly see that from 15 months post-treatment onward, the hemoglobin count is higher in the case of CTX001 treatment. But again, keep in mind 15 patients versus data from 34 patients. Nevertheless, I think this could indicate a slightly clinical superiority. I hope you found this comparison useful. If you did, please consider liking the video and leaving a subscription to my channel.